Okay, let's begin on part two. We're going to begin this one with making healthy changes. So first thing to do when making healthy changes is understand health behavior. And there's three types of influences that shape behavior. Okay, Predispos predisposing, enabling, and reinforcing factors. And we're going to look at each of these three. Predisposing factors, they include knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, values, self-efficacy, behavioral intentions, and existing skills. Other predisposing factors that play a role in a lifestyle change process include your age, your sex, socioeconomic level, ethnicity, family background, healthcare access, and levels of education. Now it's important to note that really this just says that some of this is stuff that you can't do much about. Who your family is and what your background is, you can't make a great deal of choice about. However, that is one of the factors that influences any challenge, any change we want to make in our health, is that some of these factors come forward and that's why they're predisposition or pre presupposing factors. Now the factors that enable us, these are enabling factors, they include your skill set, your access to resources, accessible facilities, you have a gym downstairs and a, and a workout facility downstairs in the, in the college, physical and mental capacities, living conditions, societal support, accessible facilities and programs and services. Now these are the things that can enable you. These are the things that can assist. It still comes down, and you'll see this a little later, it still comes down to you. And then we'll look at re reinforcing factors. And these include the praise you might get from friends and family, rewards from teachers or parents or friends, encouragement and recognition for meeting a goal, or, uh, but involves lasting change depends on the internal commitment and a sense of achievement. Now I can only emphasize the importance of um, internal commitment because that's what's going to get you going. I'm not going to get out of bed to run on a cold winter you know, morning because my alarm says wake up, I need an internal commitment that says this is what I've agreed to do for myself and I'm going to get up and do it. Okay, so there's some features and factors that influence our ability to achieve any goals, but then there's the decision making. And this is the process of maintaining or restoring health depends on our own decisions and this is very important. It's one of the things that I've also emphasized in an online class. It's your decisions, your decision making that influences whether or not you're successful in this. You're already smart enough. It's now about whether you can make the decisions you need to make to stay on top of your course material when there's no class to go to. So with decision making when it comes to health decisions, it still depends on your decisions. Decision making is a process that you can break down even the most difficult choices into manageable steps, which include setting priorities, informing yourself, considering all your options, turning into, uh, turning into your intuitive feelings, what gets you motivated, and considering the worst case scenario. You'll find on page 17 more, inf uh, more explanation on these points. Now remember, you're going to need to use your textbook in class. My videos are, only, are not as comprehensive as what's in the textbook and that doesn't replace your textbook. Your textbook is required for the course. It's going to help you immensely when it comes to test time. Now there is in your text a reference to the health, health belief model and according to this model people will take health related action based on the following factors. Perceived, sus sus perceived susceptibility, there, it's easy for me to say, perceived severity, perceived benefit, cues to action and self-efficacy. What this really just means is that this model is promoting that when we view our health changes as being, I don't feel like, you know, pre-susceptibility, pre if, if, if I'm not very likely to be a risk for, say, a heart attack or blood, high blood pressure, then I'm less likely to engage in this activity. So if I don't think I am, it's good to find out whether or not you are. Perceived severity, if it looks like it's a really tough access and tough choice to make, I might not do it. Perceived benefits, if I see the benefits to me, I'm more likely to engage in health-related action. And cues for action, 
Um, and self-efficacy is just my ability to act on my own best interests. This model has been used for uh, the years to help people change unhealthy behaviors such as smoking, overeating, inactivity to encourage them to take positive health actions such as using condoms and getting need, uh, needed vaccinations and medical checkups. And so this model is just one of many. So how can I begin to make lifestyle changes? And we're going to do this uh, just in an overview and brief, but these are things that researchers have identified as many or various um, approaches that people use in making beneficial changes. And they can include the moral model. You'll find these in your textbook. The enlightenment model, the behavioral model, the medical model, and compensatory model. Now, before they reach the stage where they can act, or before anybody can make um, get to the stage where they're ready to take action, going to do it right now, most people go through a process that includes reaching a level of accumulated unhappiness. <laughs> now, getting to a level of cumul um, accumulated unhappiness really means that we just need to get to a point where we feel like we need to do something, and that is an individual place to be. We all have a different place of I'm, I, I'm absolutely too heavy or I'm absolutely having too much trouble getting up the stairs. I shouldn't be out of breath. If that's my accumulated level of unhappiness that gets me moving, it might not get you moving. And they have a moment of truth that makes them want to change. And I hope partly this has been the case with you taking this course. Or you may just discover something that, you know what, I can do that and I will do that. Now, social and cultural norms are going to be something that are going to influence our ability to achieve goals. Behaviors that are expected, accepted, or supported by a group. Now, this group could be our friends, our family, people we associate with. It could even be our society. And that um, we can either make change easier or harder based on who we associate with and what their best intentions and what their norms in terms of the group that I'm with are. Uh, if you're aware of the norms that influence your behavior, you can devise strategies either to change them or adapt them. And it's important to be aware of who you have around you and are they supportive or are they going to be making it more difficult for you to achieve. So let's look at cons some considerations and strategies for prevention, uh, setting realistic goals. Now I could do a whole workshop <laughs> for hours, I mean, I could do three or four weeks just on goal setting, and I'm not going to. We're going to use the model that's in your textbook, and it's called SMART model. And you've probably heard this before. It's not, um, it's not the best, but it's a good place to get started. Um, here, the goals and objectives must be specific, they must be measurable, achievable, realistic, and trackable, and time-based. So that's what SMART is. Um, if you're looking at it being specific, it's important that it's, it's specific enough that it can be measurable. If, for example, I put a goal that I want to improve my health, well, how do you measure health? What do you mean? Well, I mean my heart rate, my blood pressure, or I mean the distance that I can run at any one you know, period of time, then that's measurable, so that's more specific. So your goal needs to be specific. It needs to be able to be measurable or counted. You need to be able to see discrete differences between doing it and not doing it. It needs to be achievable or realistic. Uh, it needs to be possible, reasonable, given who you are and what you're capable of doing. And it needs to be trackable and time-based. So time-based just means it needs to have a beginning and an end regarding time. I started running again. I took about two years off, gained about 30 pounds. I started running again in August late August and I've been running on a particular plan to get me back to where I was when I was running half marathons two and a half almost three years ago and I'm now into my fifth month I'm getting closer it takes a while and I'm not expecting with those of you doing assignment A that you're gonna make any huge gains in eight weeks but it's a starting point and everything has a starting point alright so that's when you're gonna use um, the smart models people doing assignment A so strategies for change, some you know, more options for change. You're not, you know, people who are doing change aren't limited to SMART. Your assignment is limited to SMART, but other 
changes that we might make could involve modeling, positive visualization, and shaping. Now you'll find a bit more explanation for this in your textbook. Modeling is essentially you doing what you see other people doing, using them as a guide. Uh, visualization is more about what you can put in your mind and imagine yourself doing and seeing the steps and seeing the strategies and, and see yourself doing that is a way of getting that started. And shaping is about doing small steps to get to long-term goals, reinforcing after each step to build and to shape your behavior. Now in your textbook, they reference uh, uh, changes, uh, sorry, stages to change. You'll find that in figure 1-10. Uh, now you notice in the first two stages, pre-contemplation -contempl and contemplation. So the first two stages is just getting to the point where you recognize you need to do something. And that's oftentimes very important. The preparation, then the action. Now the action should be immediate. My, uh, my recommendation when setting a goal is don't set a goal that's going to start in two weeks. Set a goal that's going to start today. Do something today. If I start, well, when I started um, uh, my running in August, um, I started, I had my, I, I know enough about how to do it. I started my planning and then I started running the next day. That day I went out and um, drove the route that I was going to run to make sure that the distance was going to be of the variety that I needed. So you do your action, you start it today. Maintenance is just around what do you need to do to check in to make sure that it's doing what you want it to do. And the data collection that you do. And then termination is not exactly termination. Uh, it just means that the goal has been achieved. And so you might set another goal. And you might build on the existing goals. So termination just means the goal is achieved and you don't have that particular goal. You have another one. Now, successful change, if you want to be successful, some people find it's helpful to sign a contract, a written agreement in which they make a commitment for change. And that commitment to change can be made with somebody else or it can be made to yourself. I used to post agreements on the mirrors in the refrigerator of my door, of my, uh, in my house because it's the two places I'm likely to see it and it's my remi reminder to my commitment to myself. Change also depends on the belief that you can and will be successful. That's self-efficacy. And that's a belief in yourself. Another cr um, crucial factor is the focus or locus of control. Now, there's two, two sides to this locus of control. If you believe that your actions will make the difference in your health, your local co of control is internal. I influence the world around me in terms of how it affects me. If you believe that the external focuses, uh, forces or factors play a greater role, then your focus is external. Uh, I can't run today because the weather's really bad. Well, then maybe you need to have a plan B, which would be where do I go to a treadmill? Reinforcements, either positive or negative, can also play a big role. Self-talk, the messages that you send to yourself that you uh, also play a role in your change. If you don't talk like you can do it, it's going to you know, uh, make it more difficult to do things. The better you can speak to yourself about your goals and the more optimistic you can be, the more affirming you can be, the more likely you'll be successful. Health and wellness education, the power of prevention. There's no medical treatment that can compare to the power of prevention. Prevention can take many forms. Now, the main focus in terms of our interest in prevention is primary, uh, that's one form, and that's before the fact. So anything you do as preventative, that's primary, as preventative. Consumer education, identifying people at risk and or targeting a specific community group or individual. Uh, that's also known as tertiary, but it's just a notion that you can either be preventative, which is primary, stop, you know, engage in behaviors that are going to avoid illnesses. Consumer education, do things to people who are targeted or identifying people at risk and doing tertiary or that level. In the past, uh, physicians didn't routinely incorporate prevention into their pr you know, professional practices in terms of how they did assessments. However, medical schools are now providing more training in preventative care. So the potential for prevention. Um, there's a great deal of overlap between prevention and protection. 
the very concept of protection, uh, protection implies there's a degree of risk taking or risk the immediate or indirect or long term and direct. So to know what's best to protect yourself, you have to be able to be realistically to assess the risks. So let's look at assessing risks. When we're looking at this, we'll face a host of risks from the danger of being the victim of violence to the hazards of self-destructive behaviors like drinking and drugs. At any age, the greatest health threats stem from high-risk behaviors like smoking and excessive drinking or not getting enough exercise or eating too many high-fat foods and not getting enough re um, getting regular medical checkups, or just to name a few. Environmental health risks also need to be assessed. And when we think in terms of in these sort of risks, well, what are the possible benefits? Well, some advantages may uh, make some risks worth taking. Well, is the risk voluntary? If we are willing and able, then it's a voluntary risk and we may be as prepared as we can be. Is the risk fair? Are there other alternatives? Did we explore what else we could do other than this higher risk behavior? Are lives saved or lost? That's an important risk factor. So when we think in terms of the health and the future of health and wellness, well, medical science is moving ahead at astonishing speeds. However, even with advances in medical science, it's still important to make healthy lifestyle choices that support all the dimensions of health and wellness. I hope this has been helpful for you. They're looking at chapter one. It's getting us started. We're off to the right foot and I hope you found everything that you need successfully. Let's carry on and we'll get to next week and we'll start looking at chapter four. All right, everybody. Bye now.